Hello, everybody. Welcome to the live book signing and discussion of Shannon Bream's brand new book, The Women of the Bible Speak, right over here. So thrilled for this, everybody. This is the main event. I'm Megan Alexander, thrilled to host and moderate this discussion with such a wonderful person, my dear friend, Shannon Bream. Uh, this is a special book and I'm, I'm so excited for you all to get to know it. I got a sneak peek earlier. I think it is so timely and important for us in life, in culture. Uh, Shannon went back to the Bible and she tells us about all the amazing women that have so much to say and what they can share with us in our lives. So Shannon Bream is the author, everybody. Uh, you know her from Fox News at Night, Supreme Court Justice Correspondent for Fox News. I know her as a friend. We met in a Bible study in New York City many years ago. I know her as a wonderful wife. Um, she has an adorable dog. She's a dog lover, Biscuit Bream, if you follow her on social media. She's also an accomplished uh, woman in so many ways professionally. Obviously received a law degree, attended Florida State University, Liberty University, and many, many more things. So we're going to get to know her tonight and you have the opportunity to get a signed book from Shannon and ask her a question. So if you're on social media, hop on over to premiercollectibles.com slash bream, go ahead and order a book, and then you'll get a chance to get it signed by Shannon and also ask her a question. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, love this person so, so much. Shannon Bream, everybody. Megan, thank you so much. And I could say the world about you as well. For people who know you, um, it is to love you because you are so genuine. We share our faith and that's been a great connection for us, but you have always been so kind and so supportive uh, of everything I'm working on. And uh, I always tell people this, it's true. My mom is like your biggest fan. She loves watching you on Inside Edition. And a big <laughs> Megan Alexander fan. <laughs> that is so kind of you to say. I have no doubt that many, many people that are jumping on right now feel that way about you, my dear. So many people uh, appreciate you, Shannon, appreciate your show, your witness in this world. And I know they're going to love this book. This is not the first book you've written. You also wrote Finding the Bright Side a couple of years ago. This is your second. Mm -hmm. And um, as we kick it off and everybody's putting in those orders and getting ready to ask you questions, um, just set the scene for us. How did the idea for this book come about? You know, Fox came to me last summer and they were launching the Fox News book uh, label. And the first one to come out was Pete Hegseth and a book about our warriors, our military champions. And they came to me and said, would you be interested in doing something in the faith space? What about a, a book on women in the Bible? And I said, oh my goodness, I would love to do that. I was so honored and excited to be asked. And we were on a really quick timeline. So doing this during the pandemic and the presidential election and a Supreme Court confirmation battle, it was a little bit crazy, but but I say God sent me angels along the way, people that I could bounce theological questions off of, get more information on some of the stories I've studied my whole life. I've heard them in Sunday school and in church growing up, but I learned so much in this process. And I was so inspired and reminded of God's promises, his faithfulness, and really the details of these women's stories. And um, we include everyone. We've got a murderer. We've got a prostitute. We've got a queen. We've got people who were faithful uh, from the beginning and humble, like Mary, the mother of Jesus. Um, we have others who took some twists and turns, like Tamar uh, from the Old Testament, who uh, really got a little off track. But the great theme in all of this is that God saw them. He was able to redeem even their bad decisions, which we all make from time to time or take matters into our own hands. So I just found that very reassuring um, that he uses people great and small and that he's aware of all of our circumstances um, when we're in the mountaintops and when we're in the valleys. Oh, absolutely. It's so, so good, everybody. Again, we are talking about Shannon Bream's brand new book, The Women of the Bible Speak. Jump on premiercollectibles.com if you want to ask Shannon a question or get it signed. So we've got a I'm bunch of questions. As we go. So, signing as we go. I'm and we've got we go. so many questions coming in, Shannon. I'm going to okay. get right to it if that is okay with you. Yes. So as I mentioned, it's an opportunity to get to know Shannon tonight, as well as her book. And the very first question is from John in Ashburn, Virginia. And John Hi. says, I think you went to Liberty University. If so, how was your experience there? I did. And for me, it was a fantastic experience on so many different levels. Um, my parents really didn't want me to go away to school. I was one of those kids who was really young. I was 16 as a senior in high school. So I was going away to college as a 17 year old. But once they found out about Liberty and I'd been there for a cheerleading competition camp one year, one summer, 
they had visited our school where I grew up at a Christian school and my parents were so impressed with it. And they thought you can go get a great education, but you can still be deepening your roots and your faith. I had the best experience because it, the school has everything and it continues to grow and grow, but I had professors who really knew me and saw me as a person. They knew my name. They knew when I was having a rough day or something bad happened in my family. I mean, it was just such a personalized experience. And for me, it was a beautiful way to go to college. I made lifelong friends that I still have. And I met my husband there. So I got a great education and picked up some serious benefits along the way. So for me, um, Liberty is just a great place to go if you want to continue to learn in your faith and ask tough questions. I think college age, you are going through a lot of things. I questioned my faith and, and had questions about the Bible. And it's a safe place to do that with people who will respect your feelings. Um, but they uh, can also guide you in your faith and answer some of those really tough questions. Mm, that's fantastic. That was John. There you go, John. John, and we're, we're practically neighbors. He lives in Ashburn. There it is. There it is. <laughs> uh, our next question, and I hope you're, I'm saying your name correctly. Apologize if I'm not. Morum, Morum from St. Leonard, Maryland. She has uh, a couple of thoughts to share. She says, I love your previous book and cannot Thank wait you. to read this one. She says, personally, my family has been through a lot of loss and some health issues over the past couple of years. She says, I'm getting this book and wondered if this way can help, um, she says, help her family start their path to healing. Is there anything in this book that you think would be helpful in terms of a path to healing? Yeah, I, and, and gosh, I hear that story. And, and we've all, I think it's such a rough year that we couldn't have planned for just how difficult it was gonna get financially, physically, emotionally. Um, spiritually, mentally. I mean, it's just been a drain on everyone and we've known so much loss. And so I'm so sorry that your family is going through this and um, such a difficult time. That's the really the time period in which I was writing this book and um, found a lot of encouragement because I saw there were women um, here who went to God with very, very difficult circumstances, things that they felt were unanswered prayers, years and years of asking God to hear them, to see their grief and their misery. And we see through these stories about how he does and he was working in this, he was working in the timing. And a lot of times it's so hard for us to wait. That's the most painful thing. When your family's in a struggle, you're in a health struggle, a financial struggle, whatever it is. Um, but just seeing in these stories how he was working even in the tough stuff. I don't think pain is ever without purpose. Uh, I think of this story in the book, we, we talk about the sisters, Mary and Martha and their brother, Lazarus. They were all very close friends of Jesus. And they knew Lazarus was dying and they had sent word to Jesus. Well, Lazarus died before he got there. And there was some frustration and some grief. And, and Martha said, if you would only come sooner. But Jesus ends up saying, because he goes there and resurrects Lazarus from the dead, this timing was all meant to glorify God and that people would see that I'm the son of God and that I've come to help and to save them. So there's timing even in the grief, I think, and purpose in the grief and in the struggle. And I pray that you'll quickly be on the other side of it. But I do think that you'll find encouragement in these pages as I did. I hope it will be encouraging. Mm, that's great. Our next question is Cynthia from Irvington, Kentucky. And she has for you, Shannon, this question, which of the ladies' stories surprised you the most after your study and research? Huh, I learned so much about all of them. And I've always loved the story of Queen Esther, but I had forgotten some of the really fine details. She starts out as an orphan. She is raised by her uncle Mordecai. And I learned a lot about the fact that the Jews were dispersed all over the place. They didn't have a homeland at this time. Um, many of them uh, didn't have the deep spiritual roots. It was more of a cultural experience for many of them at that point. And um, they were outsiders in the land where they were living. So when the king there decides he's going to do this search across his kingdom for a new queen, um, Esther has great favor. She is called in with all the other young women of the kingdom who go through this process. But Mordecai had warned her. He had said, don't tell them that you're Jewish. Don't talk about your background. Just go in, see how things go. Well, apparently everybody loved her. And the minute the king saw her, he said, she's the one. She is the best one. This is a months long process that these young women went through. But along the way, I had forgotten that there is a time where Mordecai actually saves the king's life because he overhears where he's sitting at the, at the gates there. He overhears a plot to kill the king. And that figures in later on. When the king asks, has anything ever been done for Mordecai? And he then elevates Mordecai in the middle of the story 
that there are so many crazy twists and turns and Esther is placed right where she needs to be Mordecai is right where he needs to be so that when the time comes that the Jewish people they are being threatened with extinction she is in the right place at the right time and she's it's not that she is unafraid because we know that when she gets word from Mordecai about this evil man who has sent out this order to exterminate the Jewish people um, she says to Mordecai, please have all the people fast for three days because she knew to go in to see the king without him requesting her uh, was essentially, it could be a death sentence. If, if you went to the king unbidden and he didn't want to see you, you could be killed on the spot. So she asked Mordecai, please get the people to fast. And at the end of those three days, if I perish, I perish. And we see the rest of her story as it plays out, every little detail where she's in a position to go to the king. God has favor on her. The king gives her favor and says, what can I do for you? What is troubling you? And she's able to make this case and save her people. And it's just an incredible story with so many details that um, maybe I'd been a little dusty and forgotten about over the years. And it was just eye-opening to go back through that story and just see how there were so many seeds planted in, and threads that were woven into that tapestry so that it all comes together in God's perfect way and his perfect timing. Mm, for such a time as this, love mm -hmm. the chapter on Esther, everybody. It's so good. All of them are good. Uh, this is Shannon Bream's live signing and discussion for her new book, The Women of the Bible Speak. She is taking your questions if you purchase a book and also signing them for you. So keep those questions coming. I love this. That's right. I love this. Um, let's see. You've got so many good questions in here, everybody. Okay. How about uh, this one? Do, 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 do. Teresa from St. Peter's, Missouri says, if you could interview one of these women, mm. Shannon, who would you choose and why, what would you ask them? Oh boy. Um, gosh, I, I would want all of them. We would have to do a series. <laughs> we all get interviewed, but I think it would be fascinating to talk to Deborah from the old Testament because she was a leader of the nation of Israel. And she's a judge and she's in this leadership role where they come to her for advice to settle disputes with theological and legal questions. She was greatly respected and revered. And when we meet her, Israel's in a lot of trouble. The Jewish people, uh, as we often do in our own lives, head straight away from God. We see this in the Old Testament where they get in trouble, they come back to God and he's faithful um, after listening to them, sometimes for years and years at a time to say, okay, I will send you someone to help you. So he's got Deborah in this position and they had been oppressed by the Canaanites. And listen, the Canaanites had everything the Israelites didn't have. They had sort of the technology of the time and the materials of the time to build 900 chariots. We were told that they had in their army. And God says to Deborah, you need to go into battle against the Canaanites and Israel's going to be victorious. And she's like, okay, let's do it. So what happens is she goes to the leader of Israel's army. His name is Barak. And she says, get the men together. God has said we are to go into battle against the Canaanites. And he's like, okay, hold on a minute here. Um, because clearly on paper or to anybody who was looking at it from the earthly perspective, it would have looked like a death mission. It would have been um, a, a crazy thing to try. And he says, I'll go if you go with me. Because he knows that Deborah is anointed. And she says, okay, I'll go with you into battle. But here's the thing, the opposing uh, general, he's going to be delivered into the hands of a woman because of your request. And I always thought as a young person, when I would hear that story in uh, church, I wouldn't finish it all the way through. And I thought Deborah was going to be the woman that uh, was the one to get the opposing general. Um, but in the book, you'll find out that's not true. And there's another woman there who takes very, very severe action to take care of that opposing general. And it fulfills the prophecy. And the thing I get from that is um, that Deborah, first of all, that she was this respected leader. She must have been very smart, but also very wise. But she was also very brave because God told her to do something. It was against all the odds and she did it anyway. And the Israelites had this resounding victory. It wasn't just they squeaked one out. I mean, there was nobody left in the opposing army except for that general who went on the run for his life. And he didn't make it because of the second woman who ended up fulfilling the prophecy. And the great thing I love the detail is about those chariots, 900 chariots where the Israelites had nothing like that. But God sent so much rain that the wheels of the chariots got stuck in the mud and they were useless. They couldn't go anywhere. So when we feel called to do something that the world would say, this makes no sense, you're crazy. If you know you've heard from God, you may be scared. Um, or you may have courage like Deborah and just go. So I would love to interview her, see what was going through her mind, what that battle was like, and what it was like to be a female leader of the entire nation.
Mm, absolutely. You know, there's a rumor going around, Shannon, that they're making a movie about Deborah, possibly well, I love it. a safe film. I know. So I read this it. chapter for some insight, everybody. It's a good one on Deborah. We need and to figure out who's going to be cast. Oh, yeah. If you're in Hollywood, this is the role you want. Trust me. Yeah, that's right. Oh, <laughs> Someone's listening right now to our life, Sunny. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's gonna be. Oh, it's gonna be epic when they make it. Uh, Shannon, that leads perfectly into this next question that Tom has for you uh, from Michigan. He says, "How has your research for this book influenced your understanding of life in general for women in these times?" Mm -hmm. That is such a great question. And like I said, there were theologians and scholars and people that I turned to because I had a lot of questions. Again, having a working knowledge of the stories is one thing, but not speaking Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic myself, it was very helpful to be able to turn to some people that I really respect to say, what was the custom at this time or what would this have meant? And I learned so much. So you think about uh, in the Old Testament, we have Sarah and Hagar that we talk about in the book, a very contentious relationship there. Um, Sarah, the wife of Abraham, got a little ahead of God in his plan and what he had promised her. She decided she wanted a child and it had been promised that Abraham would be the father of great nations. And what she did was something that was common back in those days. She took her servant, who we find out really through the translation is more of a slave. She didn't have a choice to leave. And she sent her servant to Abraham and said, have a child with her, then we'll have a child, you'll have an heir and we can move on. As you could imagine, that had some consequences and it got really messy, but I learned a lot about how this worked in those times, um, how heirs worked. And also we have stories of widowhood in the Bible and I learned how it worked in those days as well in a family where um, the story of Ruth, where she um, was somebody who, um, Naomi was her mother-in-law and both Naomi's husband and her two sons who were married to Ruth and Orpah, both of them died, the father died. So there's this whole process about a kinsman redeemer or a near relative who can take on one of those women and provide an heir for the man who's actually been deceased. So I learned so much and I learned a lot about the women in the New Testament as well, because I have the story of the woman who has the issue of bleeding, who's very ill for 12 years, goes from doctor to doctor. We're told by the time we meet her in the gospel, she has no money left. She has no resolution or healing to her problem. And what I found out too, from the scholars I talked with, they said, listen, she would have been considered probably unclean, meaning she couldn't have worshiped in the temple. She shouldn't have gone to the market. She shouldn't have been around crowds or left her home. So I'd always identified with her story because she has such great faith and just thinking, if I can just get out and touch the hem of this man, Jesus's garment, it will heal me. There's such a beautiful interaction between them. But I didn't understand before that she probably was breaking all the norms and really risking a lot by being out in public and being in that crowd the way that she was based on the illness that she had. So I learned a ton about each of these women and kind of the customs of the day and what would have been expected and, and normal for them. And we find in the New Testament, Jesus broke up a lot of those norms. And I thought it was important to tell that part of the story too, because he treated women as equals and with respect. And he went to them where they were. They didn't have to clean up their lives. Like we don't have to. He takes us as we are and wants to start that relationship with us um, from wherever you are at this moment. Mm, sees everyone. So, so good. Shannon, this is a fun one from Elizabeth in North Carolina. She says, hi, Shannon. What is your all-time favorite memory from Liberty University? I'm also a Liberty, Liberty University alum. Go Flames. Go Flames. And I love North Carolina too. I lived there for three years in Charlotte, worked in a great market there for CBS at WBTV. I have wonderful memories. Uh, they're wonderful memories of uh, Liberty. Well, it's got to be meeting my husband. And here's the truth. I, we had a mutual friend who kept trying to get us together and we were always dating other people. Um, we met my senior year at the homecoming game. We were both there and she grabbed him and grabbed me and said, you guys are both here. It's time for you to meet. We were both dating other people at the time. So we didn't end up together then. Um, but there were some spits and starts and eventually we were both single at the same time. Um, but he was a baseball player. And I kind of had this impression of the guys, all the athletes is sort of having a good time, not very serious, maybe not husband material. So we go on the date. I'm thinking, well, I'm going to graduate soon. I knew I was going off to law school, but I thought he's cute and I like the looks of him. So why not, you know, let's go on a date. Let's have some dinner and see what happens. And he just blew me away because I expected him to be just sort of a good time guy and not very serious. And I found out he was this person of deep faith and he and his roommate made me dinner. Um, he's still the one who cooks, you know, that a pet our house. 
<laughs> I'm not a great cook. Um, he cooks almost every night and he's really great at it. And um, we went to a Christian concert and he'd made a mixtape, which I'm dating myself. Um, they don't really have those anymore, but he had made this playlist of songs for us because we were driving about an hour each way to this concert we were going to. And he was just totally different than I thought he was going to be. And we both say we met at exactly the right time because had we met any earlier in our years at Liberty, I don't think we would have been in the right spot um, maturity wise and having learned some lessons from other relationships and grown up a little bit ourselves. Um, so he's definitely the best part and the best memory of Liberty for sure. Oh, and you guys are a great team. If you know Shannon's hubby, Sheldon is awesome. Wonderful, wonderful team. So cool. Okay, yeah. let's see. This is a fun one. So Mary Ann from Newport News, Virginia, she ordered a book on the website. That's how she's able to ask a question. If anybody's just joining us, that's the process. And we'd love to hear from you. So just go to premiercollectibles.com slash bream, jump on, order the book, the women of the Bible speak, and then you can ask Shannon a question. Mine on display right there. Okay. So Mary Ann says, Shannon, I think you are one of the most trusted commentators on any channel. Thank you. How did you go about writing this book? What was your process? How long did it take you to do it? I normally would have given myself a lot more time for this, but we were on a bit of an expedited schedule to try to get it done. Um, so we taught, we first started talking about the pairs of women. We decided to pair them up. Some of them knew each other. So it made sense like Mary and Martha, Leah and Rachel, others would have been centuries apart, not known each other at all, like Queen Esther. And I really fought to include Rahab, the prostitute in her chapter, because we looked for common themes and, and I love the juxtaposition of God using humble people, quiet people that you may not have heard of otherwise, and people as prominent as Queen Esther, who, listen, she had her own fears and struggles, um, but we thought, let's put them in pairs. Let's think about how we can, um, you know, compare and contrast their lives, find common threads. For Queen Esther and for Rahab, it was that they both were put in the right place at the right time to help the people of Israel survive and have victories as a nation. They were critical, um, and, and I love that there are people, like I alluded to earlier, Tamar, a lot of people don't know her story, it's a little saucy. It's not an easy Sunday school story to tell, um, but she is widowed twice. There is a third son and the dad's like, you go back to your family. He's too young for you. And I'm thinking the dad's probably thinking, I don't want to lose a third son. But what the Bible tells us is both of her first two husbands, Tamar's, were wicked in God's sight. So he took care of him. He took him out. So by the law, the, the Levitical law at that time, um, Levitical marriage, she would have gotten the next son so that he could produce an heir for her husband who had died. So I learned a lot about that process, but she doesn't get the son. The father-in-law sends her away. Now here's where she gets a little bit off track. She cooks up her own plan. And now her father-in-law is widowed. She knows he's going to be traveling somewhere. She veils herself and hides herself and she disguises herself as a prostitute. They get together. He doesn't have payment for her. So he leaves his staff and his signet ring and his cord. Now, Back in those days, that would have been the closest thing you have to, you are the father, to DNA proof um, for something to happen. So she turns out to be pregnant. Now the father-in-law is furious because he feels like she's shamed the family. And he calls for her to be burned, calls for her to come in. Now she doesn't publicly shame him, but what she does is sends the staff and the ring and the cord and says, this is the man who is the father of my child. Turns out she has twins. And he actually says, you know what? She's more righteous than I am because... Uh, of the way that she handled this. And I did the wrong thing by not following the law and giving her my third son. She ends up having twins and she is in the lineage of Jesus Christ. So her story shows us that even when you get wildly off track, um, God can certainly make good of that and he can use that. And we all make messes and make bad decisions. I think Tamar could be included in that, but it turned out that God redeemed it for his purposes. So, um, you know, I just think that there are a lot of stories here that um, can lead us to a lot of good conclusions that God is always working in whatever we're doing. Although he'd probably prefer we stay on track. We all get off track at some point. Yeah. Yeah. I had the opportunity to read an early manuscript of this book, everybody. And Shannon, that's what I was thinking. It's, it's full of messy stories, but God uses these women's mess for their message and what strong messages they all have. Every single woman, like you said, all different backgrounds, and God sees them all and uses them all in a different and unique way. Oh, this is a great question. So Christy from Gig Harbor, Washington, beautiful area. Christy says, Shannon, how have you felt God's hand in your life and career? Gosh, everywhere and uh, all the time, I would say. Um, I write a lot about this in my first book, Finding the Bright Side. Um, I'm, I try to be as 
vulnerable and transparent as I could because I think that's the only way to sort of um, encourage other people uh, by being honest about your own pain. And I talk about times, um, listen, my first job, my first TV job, I'd been a lawyer, I kind of risked everything and went off to work in local news. I loved it from day one, had the most unglamorous job. I worked 2 a.m. to 11 a.m. I answered phones and made coffee. I wrote scripts for the morning anchors. Sometimes I would work the prompter um, and just kind of learned as I was going. And I had a boss there who decided to take a chance on me. And once in a blue moon, if they had no one else and a story was breaking, he would send me and let me do things on camera once in a while. And um, he left. And two weeks later, there was a new boss and he called me in and the head of HR was sitting there and I thought, I'm getting promoted. No, if the head of HR is sitting there, you're probably not getting promoted. And he told me I was the worst person he had ever seen on TV and that I would never make it in the business. And so that was a huge gut punch to me. Um, I really was thrown for a loop and it took months before I could even get an interview anywhere else. So there were a lot of days of searching, God, am I doing the right thing? Um, but also half jokingly saying to God, I know there's a lesson in this. So if you could just drop it on me and I'll get it and then we can move on. Um, that's not how it works. <laughs> so I learned a lot in that process about humility, about being honest and working hard and, and taking criticism and figuring out how you can get better. We always have room for improvement. I'm still working on things every day. Um, but I've had personal struggles too, where I, I lived with chronic pain and chronic illness for a few years. And it, it just broadened my base of empathy for other people and their issues and problems because everybody is in pain or has been in pain or will be in pain over something. So um, during that, you know, I, I share a moment where I found out that what I have is not curable. There's no cure for it. It's a genetic condition with my corneas. Um, that was causing them to tear a lot every day. If you've ever scratched your eye, you know what that's like. And it was just never ending cycle for me, but there are treatments and I have a wonderful doctor that I believe God sent to me. I prayed for someone to help me and I got into this doctor and I still like to tell him whenever I see him, like, don't forget your God's answer to prayer for me. And he's sort of, okay, <laughs> but it's true. Um, but I, there was a moment when he told me that there was no cure for this. And I remember getting in my car and just sobbing and sobbing and going back um, to the studio, I was going to have to go back and, and do a show. And I remember just praying, you know, God, please help me. Um, I, not an eloquent prayer, but many times during that struggle, I, that's all I would say, Lord, please help me or God, please help me. I couldn't put together anything more fancy than that. And I remember feeling him say, not that I've heard his voice audibly, but I felt him say to my spirit, I will be with you. Not that I'm going to heal you, I'm going to take away all your pain and miraculously, this is going to go. He can do that. And I believe he can. And he does in some situations, but what I felt him say to me was, I will be with you. And that's been true. I mean, um, in every tough circumstance, getting fired, getting an incurable diagnosis, um, going through my husband's brain tumor. I mean, all the things along the way he has been faithful and hasn't always worked in the way that I would have wished or hoped, but in ways that work for his good and for his glory, um, so I felt his hand in his, in my life many, many times, it's especially in the toughest parts, I would say. Yeah. Wow. For anybody just tuning in, I mean, two takeaways, one Shannon Bream, who I believe is one of the best journalists on television right now, Thank you, but let go early on in her career. <laughs> Unbelievable, but you didn't let it stop you. <laughs> so, Worst person on television. That was, that was a little bit of a crush to the ego, but it's good. It keeps you in check. I was going to say, and look where you are now, stay the course. God has a plan. And then okay. second that you have dealt with this chronic pain, Shannon, we watch you every night for an hour and had no idea that you were battling through such pain. And again, God used it. And as you said, you clung to your faith in those times. That's incredible. I, that's why I love doing these. Cause we get to hear things that you don't always see on television. You, know, you never know what somebody's going through. That is um, so true. Yeah. Oh, thank you for sharing that. And I'm so glad you're doing better too. Yes. Praise. Praise the Lord and thank the Lord. Yes. Okay, everybody, more questions coming in. If you're just joining us, premiercollectibles.com slash Bream. You order a book, The Women of the Bible Speak, Shannon Bream's brand new book, which is incredible. And that's how you get to ask a question or share a comment. Shannon is signing them as we speak. And I'm trying to get through these as quick as I can. These are great. Okay. Let's see. Well, Joseph from Columbia, South Carolina just says no question, just a thank you for writing this book that I can pass down to my granddaughter. Thank you. Oh, and God bless. Thank you so much. And by the way, I did a summer clerkship in Columbia, South Carolina was when I was in law school at a huge firm there. And it is a beautiful city. It is very hot in the summertime. And I say that as somebody who grew up in Florida, 
but what a bunch of um, friendly, friendly people, beautiful architecture, great food. And um, thank you, Joe. Nice to meet you. Absolutely. Kirsten from Pauling, New York says, this is a tough one, Shannon. Uh-oh. Like a mother doesn't want to pick her favorite child. She's Uh-oh. asking you to pick your favorite woman of the Bible. <laughs> Kirsten says, what is your favorite woman of the Bible? What makes her so inspirational to you? And what makes her your favorite? Mm-hmm. I would say that this could change from day to day. Um, just because you know, sometimes you need different kinds of inspiration or different kinds of help, but I've always, always loved the story that I start the book with, which is that woman who had not been healed and she was struggling. I think because I went through that period of going from doctor to doctor and just living in such discouragement and despair, feeling like I would never get help or get answers. I've always loved her story. And the fact that I realized what a chance that she took by going out to touch the hem of Jesus garment in this crowd, um, she's in the gospels multiple times, but we don't know her name. But, you know, he turns around and he says, who touched me in one of the accounts? And one of the disciples is like, uh, you're in this crowd all the time. Everybody's touching you. But Jesus obviously knows who touched him. I mean, that's he knows. We know if God asks a question like without him and Eve, where are you in the garden? He knows. So what we're told is that she falls down trembling before him in the Gospels. Um, she must have known, listen, this man who was powerful enough to heal me just by me touching the hem of his garment. He knows exactly who I am. And he knows that I shouldn't be here. So instead of any kind of, um, you know, embarrassment of her, of, of outing her with her problem or saying you shouldn't be here or you didn't ask permission to touch my garment or ask me for healing or for a miracle, Jesus doesn't do any of that. In every account, he turns to her and the first word he says is daughter. And I love that. It just goes to my heart every time I think about that, because I think he's giving her complete acceptance. I'm not judging you. I'm here to heal you. I'm full of compassion. I'm not going to embarrass you in front of these people. And he's also communicating to all those people. She is acceptable. She is my child. She is my daughter. And I just love that he has such mercy on her and that she had such faith to go out and do something like this. And I think she suffered for 12 years. God knew that whole time. Um, There was no mystery about that to him. He knew he would encounter her one day and have the chance to heal her. And I think about all the people in her life who knew exactly what she was dealing with. Um, It wouldn't have been a secret. So for her to now go back to her community and be able to say, hey, all those doctors that I went to and everything that I spent, no one could help me. This guy is really the real deal. He, He healed me. It's a miracle. So he was able to use her suffering and turn it to something very beautiful. And I've I've just always loved her story because she, she took such a leap of faith and I just identify with her. But, you know, if you ask me tomorrow, I don't know. It might be Mary, the mother of Jesus. I don't know. Um, They're all really, really strong and special. Yeah. It's hard to pick. I just got to show you guys this cover. I think it's so beautiful. Shannon, how did you decide on the cover? You know what? I'm color coordinated. I realized today with my purple, Um, I cannot take any credit for the cover. So that was something um, that the publisher worked on and Fox news, uh, this being, you know, just a second book that's coming out under their label. Um, So when they came to me with the final, this is what we think we're going to do. I was like, wow, this is beautiful. I can't take any credit, but I've had a lot of people say that they think it's um, very pretty. So um, no credit to me, but I am color coordinated today. And, and hopefully people will look at it and think um, it looks uplifting and positive and um, something that it's, it's very much Easter and springtime and Mother's Day. And so it's that time of year. And hopefully this is a rebirth on many levels because I think all of us are ready to put the past year behind us, put winter behind us and hopefully have very good things ahead. Absolutely. Great gift idea for Mother's Day, for Easter, um, somebody that's got a baby, um, anyone that just needs some encouragement and inspiration. I have a daughter. I can't wait to talk to this about her when she gets you know a little bit older. So great, great gift idea, everybody. Keep that in mind. Okay. Marsha or new box. What's that? Sorry, new box? the new box. We're, we're doing some more books. That's All right. We're rolling through the books here. Uh, premiercollectibles.com slash Bream. Shannon is signing and answering questions. Marsha or Marcia um, from Corinth, New York says, when will you and Megan do the Fox Nation <laughs> Ainsley's Bible study again? We should. <laughs> Listen, that's how we met doing Bible study together, as you said, in New York. That is how we met. Actually, our mutual friend is Ainsley Earhart, and we met at her literal Bible study. It really is a Bible study, but long before it became a TV show. So uh, thank you you for that. It would be very fun to reunite, especially once we can all be COVID safe and be back together. Um, I think everybody's probably overdue for some hugs and just to have some time together. A cup of coffee. There might be some cupcakes or something there. I feel like that might need to happen too. 
Absolutely. I know we are all missing that and so ready for it to come back, but at least we can do things like this uh, to stay connected. Connect, yes. Okay. Let's see. So Johnny from Dallas, Texas just wants to say thank you for keeping your faith first and for spreading the news about the Bible. God bless. Thank you. And by the way, I'm going to be in Dallas in a couple of weeks, Lord willing, if everybody stays um, well and healthy, um, you know how these things go these days, it's kind of tentative, but the plan is to be at First Baptist of Dallas uh, with Pastor Robert Jeffress on April 11th. And so um, if all goes well, we'll see you there in Dallas. There you go. Maybe uh, Johnny will be able to show up and anybody else in the Texas area. This is a great question from Karen in Springfield, Virginia. She says, Shannon, what helps you to stay grounded in your faith when you report news and events that can be really difficult? Yeah, I would say, honestly, without my faith, um, and Megan, you know this, you have to cover tough things sometimes that are uncomfortable or, or frightening. Um, I, I couldn't do it without my faith um, to give me some perspective and to give me hope that there is goodness uh, in the world and that the ultimate ending of the story is one of redemption. And it's really just become um, an even deeper commitment for me the last year. Um, I, you know, I think about when COVID started and it was such a shock to the system and people immediately are losing people they love. They are, they're becoming very sick. They're losing their income. Um, their kids are out of school and now they're worried about them trying to develop and keep going. Um, they have real financial worries and concerns and everybody's afraid of getting sick. And I thought every day when I got up, it was so hard just to even turn on my phone because you'd see, you know, the markets are crashing and the death numbers are up, the hospitalizations. Um, these amazing frontline workers, whether it was in law enforcement or in medicine, are stretched to the max. They're exhausted. They're losing their lives. It was just an overwhelming flood of bad news for everybody. And I said, you know what? I'm just going to have to get back to basics. Um, I spend time, I try to every day in the word and praying and journaling. And I said, it's just got to be the first thing. I can't even turn on my phone. I know there's a lot waiting for me when I get up. I have a weird schedule because I do a show that ends at midnight and I go to bed between one and two. And so I get up a little bit later, like between nine and 10. And there's a mountain of email waiting for me. And I thought, I'm not prepared right now to do that. So last year, I just made it a daily practice that um, you know, if it's an emergency, somebody's going to know how to reach me, but I can't turn those phones on until I've read the word. I've spent time with God. I've gotten his reassurances that he is with me and there's purpose in all that he is doing. And that though the foundations of the world be shaken, he is not going to be shaken. So I've got to do that. I just, I need to, to put on that armor or get those boots every day renewed so that I'm ready for whatever comes, whether it's personal, uh, or whether it's, you know, professional reporting on some um, really difficult story, but it was a good wake up call for me because I realized how much comfort I took in just the daily things of the world that were very comfortable and easy in my life. And when all those things kind of get rattled and ripped away, it reminded me like, huh, maybe I have gotten a little bit too comfortable and, and let other things sneak in on my pri priority, which should be my time with God and having him first. So for me, it was a good um, renewal of that. And that's what helps me every day. Mm. And that is a major commitment because Shannon, you are so busy. I don't know how you do it all. You too, uh, my and, friend. Well, listen, you were just on Fox news, literally minutes before we went live here for this live signing. Shannon was on the five. I had it on, on my TV. So I'm watching <laughs> her thinking she's going to get to this spot within a couple minutes, yes. but, um, I, this is a great question. McKinley from Taswell, Tennessee. Uh, she says, are you going to still do your show tonight? Will we still see you on? Yes. <laughs> Uh, I, people, the only person not sick of me at this point is my mom because, um, <laughs> she's excited to see everything, but yeah, I started with Fox and friends this morning, our morning show. And, uh, I've been reporting throughout the day, did the five excited to do this. And yes, the 11 o'clock Lord willing, that's the plan to do the show tonight. So, um, there are long days, but making, you know, when you love what you do, uh, I'm so inspired by covering the news of the day, the events of the day. Um, and trying to find those good nuggets too. We try to end our show every night with the good news and good night. Um, so yeah, there will be a show tonight. If I am not face down asleep in some Chick-fil-A, uh, I'll be there at 11 Eastern. Oh, there you go. I don't know how you do it lady, but it's amazing. And by the way, McKinley says you're the best. Oh, totally thank you. And I love that, that name. What a, what a fun name. Yeah, that is a beautiful name. I love that. And I am in uh, Franklin, Tennessee, and I've never heard of Tazewell. I hope I said that right. Or Tazewell, Tennessee. 
It's very cool. Um, we got a couple more here. If you follow Shannon on social media, we have to comment on our earrings because she'll oh, oh, yes. look at these. I mean, I think you're one of the most stylish women on television. I know people <laughs> agree with me, but uh, I never wear earrings and I wore some for you. Hey, I feel fancy because you're wearing earrings today. <laughs> Just because... You have three little ones running around. So I'm sure that you have to be careful with not <laughs> getting caught in your beautiful hair. And, um, you know, people ask me and they probably ask you too. Um, questions about makeup and about clothing and about earrings. And some people will say, why are you asking her that? She's talking about important stuff. I'm like, no, no, that's the question I would ask too. And I'm happy to answer as much as I can, but the earrings got to be a thing where people were asking her for the earrings. So we tried to start doing updates. So I need to get back to those, but um, I'm all about a sale. I love Francesca's. Um, I, I love a good deal. So I'm always looking for something. Um, and my husband says, don't, you don't always have to tell people everything's on sale or that you got a deal, but I like to, because I like to get a sale. I like to know. Um, but these earrings, actually, my my last assistant, Anna, who is now happily married and um, now working for a congressman and moved to uh, Indiana, she gave me these because she knows I like really fun earrings. So um, I wanted to do something a little sparkly for today. They look great. And listen, you're a pageant girl too, as I, right, you as and I, I have we like our sparkles. Fun. Yes, we do. Honestly, if I could get away with wearing like sequins and a tutu every day, when I see little cuties, like your little sweet little daughter, where I see other cute little girls who it's age appropriate because they're like four walking around in the cute sparkly outfits and the tutus and the, and the bedazzled tennis shoes. I'm like, Oh, I wish I could dress like that. I don't think it's appropriate at my age, but if I could find a, re a reason to wear sequins or rhinestones any day, I'll take it. There you go. Tune in, everyone. Maybe one night Shannon will show up and do the you news in a sequined gown. You never know. Uh, we are talking about her brand new book, The Women of the Bible Speak. Shannon Bream is the author. It is available at premiercollectibles.com slash Bream to get your signed copy, which Shannon is doing and taking questions from all of you. And we've got a couple more minutes here. So keep those questions rolling in. This is a really great one from Scott in Chicago. Scott says, congratulations on your book, Shannon. Women are society's moral compass. What would the women of the Bible tell today's women to do to stop cancel culture and end the hostility toward constitutional rights that have made our country great and free? Gosh, there are women in here and we've talked about Deborah, but she is somebody who spoke truth, did not water down the message, was not afraid when she was called into something that would have seemed controversial and nuts. So I think Deborah probably would have been very good with cancel culture. Um, but, you know, we have a whole chapter in the end that's an additional chapter about Jesus and the women. And I think um, he's clearly the earthly male figure who gets the most attention in the book, divine, but his or time on earth as um, walking in, in our shoes as a human being as well. But he was the he was the really the anti cancel culture guy because he did things all the time. The religious leaders of the day were trying to trip him up and ensnare him, asking tricky questions, putting him in situations that were tough. Um, and he also did things like hung out with um, the tax collector, um, went to uh, the woman at the well, uh, defended the woman who was accused of adultery and was a, about to be stoned to death. I mean, he knew about cancel culture. People were always after him. And he was always showing up for people who were also had people after them. So I think that he is one. And listen, he told us in this trouble, in this life, you will have trouble. Um, but I've, I've overcome the world. So I think that he is somebody who would know cancel culture better than any of us because he constantly had people trying to discredit him, to question who he really was, to put him in a corner, to trip him up. Um, and so he was strong through all of that. Um, but what I, I love also is that he suffered as we do, uh, he, it, there's no temptation that we've been through or that we face that he doesn't understand, including cancel culture. Um, I was reading yesterday, uh, uh, again, through the time leading up to the crucifixion and through the crucifixion and about how his most um, devoted friends, the disciples were with him and he knows what's coming. And he goes and he asks them to pray and he keeps coming back the third time he comes back. They've been asleep every time he's come back. And he must have felt so abandoned in that. And he knew what was coming, but he didn't say, take me out of this. He said, God, your will be done. So I don't think anybody's ever faced a worse cancel culture situation than Jesus. And he was faithful through it. Um, we're not divine. We can call on his strength. Um, but these women too, I mean, they stood up, um, Mary Magdalene and Mary, mother of Jesus. Um, we've done a podcast about that, Megan, people can find it on my Instagram just talking about how they were faithful and showing up um, and they were part of Jesus ministry and with him and part of his inner circle. 
at a time when people were um, trying to take out anyone who was associated with him. So I think we have a lot of strong examples of people standing up when they felt under pressure for what they believed in. Amen. So great. Uh, we've got a question from Stephen and Patrina Mosley in Alexandria, Virginia. I recognize those names. Oh, okay. Yeah, I was just going to say, they say, go Liberty University. Yay, Love yes. that you rep LU in promo for this book. Uh, they'd like you to share your favorite Liberty University story. Do you have any Dr. Jerry Falwell senior stories? Keep up the great work you're doing on Fox News at night. Thank you very much. They are the sweetest, most amazing couple. Um, Okay, uh, my dad, who has passed away, was so excited. He came to Liberty my senior year um, for the homecoming game. I was part of the homecoming thing, whatever. So my dad comes and they have this really nice lunch before the homecoming game for all the parents and the young women. And um, my dad is there and he is always the life of the party. Like he would be the one with the lampshade on his head. He was always telling the corny, slightly problematic jokes, probably half of what he said in his lifetime, he would be totally canceled for now. Um, he was very colorful, um, but he was um, always wanted to be in the middle of things. And so one of the questions they asked and Dr. Falwell is there, um, meaning senior, and he was always on campus. He had the best memory for remembering your names, your family, what was going on. And he um, had asked, or somebody had asked as part of this luncheon, which family has traveled for the farthest to be here today for this special event? And this one family stood up and said, um, Panama City. And we're from Tallahassee. So there's a Panama City in Florida. My dad's like, that's not any farther than Tallahassee. And my dad stands up and says, Tallahassee. And the other guy stands up and says, Panama City, Panama. <laughs> it was sort of like, oh, <laughs> and Dr. Fobble's laughing. My dad's sort of like, okay, I'm going to sit down now. Um, so I remember that with of Liberty because it, it reminds me of my dad and just what a goofball he was. But the Dr. Fobble thought that was hilarious too. Um, and he actually married Sheldon and I when we got married, um, you know, a, a good ways before he passed away. And Sheldon had called him after we got engaged. And he was, he was a big, like, kind of larger than life, a little bit of an intimidating figure. And he called him and said, I want to let you know, Dr. Falwell, that I, I um, proposed to Shannon DePew, and she said, yes, and we're going to get married, and Dr. Falwell was like, that's great, I'm so happy for you, another couple who's come through Liberty and found each other, and I wish you all the best, and kind of all these congratulations, like, good for you, and, you know, God bless you guys, and sort of hung up, and so I'm like, now I got to call him back and tell him I want him to come marry us, <laughs> and so he calls him right back, and Dr. Falwell was like, sure, I'll be there. And um, he came to our wedding and it was a, a huge blessing for us. So I have a lot of good memories of Dr. Falwell because he very much was somebody that walked around campus. Like I said, he knew people's names. He was always in a suit. So he would show up you know, to baseball games, football games, um, the student cafeteria, which by the way, is a thousand percent better now than when I went there. Um, and he was just very involved in campus in a, in a very hands-on way, getting to know people who their families were in the whole thing. So. Um, he was very much a larger than life guy, but loved the kids and loved the school and the campus so much. Oh, that's great. Love those memories. Thank you for that question, Stephen and Petrina. So got a couple more minutes to go here, everybody. If you want to, yes, throw in a question real quick, order the book, premiercollectibles.com slash bream. Shannon will autograph them. This is the only way to get an autograph book on the premier collectibles website. So if you want to take advantage of it, order right now. Yes. She is signing it as we speak. Gorgeous penmanship there. Okay. And a few more <laughs> questions here <laughs> to get to with Shannon. And I so appreciate all these. These are so great. I'm trying to quickly get through all of them, but uh, one up here that just came in Tyler from Beaverton, Michigan. Did we do Tyler yet? I think I remember that. Yeah, he, he, this is a great question. He says, I find life a constant struggle. I, like you, have physical health problems. He said, I also live in a time where most of my convictions are ridiculed and um, archaic. It's hard to live with all of that. He says, it's hard sometimes not to be angry or sad. I try to keep the faith, but I lose hope sometimes. Could you give me your best advice on how to deal with all that? And could you tell me how you deal with your struggles? Mm -hmm. Tyler, I'm so sorry. I mean, we all have felt those moments where we feel overwhelmed by all kinds of things. And certainly um, when you try to stand up for things that you believe in and you find a lot of folks are not supportive of that or are outright hostile to it, um, it's very hurtful. And, um, you know, I, I got to a point where I just had to sort of 
give it up, let it go, put it at God's feet. You know, he talks about cast all your cares on me for I care for you. Um, and and we, there are just burdens that we cannot possibly carry all of them. And, you know, I realized the battle's not mine, it's his. And I try to treat people as I'm sure you do with respect, see them as children of God. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We can have different positions, but love and respect each other. And you may not feel like you're getting that back. That's probably the hurt and the frustration there. So please hang in there and know that God, you know, Jesus is always advocating for you as a believer. He's always advocating for you. Um, so that's not going to change. I love the verses in second Corinthians 12 as well, where he talks about Paul is talking about this thorn in his side, this thing he struggles with and theologians kind of debate if that was physical or mental or something else. But he talks about in those verses that my, um, my, your strength is made perfect in my weakness. So God knows we're going to struggle. He knows we're going to feel overwhelmed. He knows that there may be problems that don't go away for us. Um, but Paul talked about, um, you know, he counted it joy, basically, to have hardships and to be persecuted because he knew that God was being glorified through it and that God would be his strength through that. So um, for me, sometimes memorizing scripture, memorizing verses, putting them on a note card, reading them over and over when I'm really in a struggling point, um, even praying them, if I don't have the right words, reading those, those um, verses as a prayer, um, I just find when I spend time there and read it, um, sometimes just the same thing over and over. It is soothing to my soul. Um, and sometimes I will listen to, I found Christian meditation on YouTube where people just read sections from the Bible or tell a story from the Bible. It's a very soothing voice. And sometimes when I'm really anxious and overwhelmed by things, um, it helps me to get to sleep. It helps me to feel God's presence. So I hope some of those things may be helpful to you, but just know that I will pray for you, Tyler. I will put you on my list because I know it's hard to feel like um, you're in the battle and um, feeling sort of down and out, but you never really are, trust me. Mm, amen. That's great. Thank you, Shannon. It's such a good book, everybody. The Women of the Bible Speak. It is out. Shannon is signing uh, special copies right now, been working our way through. And uh, Shannon, we just have a couple more minutes, but uh, what would you say is the takeaway for this book? Um, what's the if, if you could possibly narrow it down to just the, the big nugget for you, what was that moment where you just thought people need to know this about the book? You know what? It's that these problems and the solutions are timeless because I look at these women centuries ago and they're dealing with things that are very 2021 problems, family ruptures, widowhood, infertility, chronic illness, um, financial destitution, um, one thing after another. I mean, those things are, are universal. We've all um, known someone or struggle with those things ourselves. So sometimes we feel very alone in that. But the fact is these women over time have struggled with those same things. God was there. He saw their misery and their struggles. He intervened. And so what I hope is that people will be able to see those stories and see it, it for themselves, that there is relief. There are promises. There's hope there, just like there was back then. God is still mindful of everything we're facing now. Uh, we included study questions in the book. I love study questions. Um, so I hope that those will help you to get to a deeper understanding and maybe find the principle or the application for your own life. Um, I like to do those in groups too. And a lot of Bible studies are Zoom now, but whichever way that you decide to use the questions, um, I love a group too, because I get other perspectives and other people's take. Uh, take some things. So I hope that the questions will help you just to take it that next level uh, to find out what will be helpful and apply to your lives. Yeah. I love that you included the study questions, a great idea, maybe for a Bible study, get some yeah. ladies together, whether, you, you know, if we can just zoom right now, we'll yeah. be back in person soon, I think, but a great book to do as a group. I'm going to get together some ladies in Nashville. You know who you are. We need to do this book. Ah. Yeah. It's Wish I was there with you. I'm with you in spirit. There you go. Maybe you can just uh, zoom in occasionally. No, then everyone will ask you to do that. But, oh, I love to. I <laughs> no, love but to. instead, it's all here. Shannon is here in the book, everybody. She's Look, all I got my last page. one left. Perfect timing. Okay. We made it through. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, this is so fun. It's the Women of the Bible Speak, the wisdom of 16 women and their lessons for today. Shannon Bream is the author and our special guest. And thank you so much to everybody who sent in their questions. Great variety of questions there yeah. Uh, about, yeah, right. It was good, good balance. I was you waiting are. for somebody to say, you know, what song do you sing in the shower? <laughs> <laughs> well, I was singing on the five today, a little love boat. I do love TV themes. They're very easy. They're very catchy, you know? Oh, oh. I don't know if shows even have themes anymore. I mean, I'm thinking like the 80s sitcoms. I don't know. I'm, I'm dating myself. 
Sure, um, absolutely. Saved by the Bell comes to mind immediately. When I wake up in the morning, theme song. Exactly. <laughs> Megan is a singer too. She's got a lot of talents. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, everybody grab your copy. The women of the Bible speak. Um, I think it's so timely right now for culture. When you think of conversations going on in faith circles, in life, the role of women in business, you name it. Um, Shannon goes right back to the Bible and says, what does God have to say about women? How did Jesus treat women, elevate them? Uh, it's, it's what we need right now. So Shannon, thank you for writing this book. Thank you, my friend, for being so supportive and for moderating our conversation today. I loved hearing from people. I loved all the questions. And hello to those of you that I know. Um, I think about the most least. Thank you for your question. And um, I just hope it'll be encouraging to folks and maybe somebody who even is intimidated by the Bible or wouldn't pick it up or, or be a person of faith. These stories are amazing. And I was so glad to have the opportunity to dig them out and to tell them to you and share them with you. And hopefully um, you'll have some laughs and you'll be inspired um, and, and feel um, some help for whatever you're struggling with as well. You are beginning to go out on some events, Shannon. How can people find out where you're going and keep track of you? You know, we're not doing a whole lot because it's so different right now, but we will be in Dallas at First Baptist on April 11th, and we've got a women's event in Memphis on April 24th, and it will put those out on social media, at Shannon Bream on Twitter, and at Shannon Bream on uh, Instagram, and they're, I'm there on Facebook as well. So we'll make sure that it's out there if you're in either Dallas or Memphis area, and maybe we'll see you. There you go. And if you still want to get an autographed copy of her book, go to premiercollectibles.com slash Bream. Shannon will sign them. And that is the spot to get an autographed copy of this book. So thank you so much, my friend, Shannon Bream, everybody. We know her, we love her. And I'm so proud of her in this brand new book, The Women of the Bible Speak. Thank you for joining everybody. Try to get through as many questions as we possibly could, but you can catch up with Shannon on social media and I know she'll continue to answer questions there. So I'm Megan Alexander. Thanks for being with us tonight, everybody. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks guys. Bye, everybody.